Welcome to Lecture 7 in the History of Terrorism. Today we will be exploring the topic Terrorism of the New Left and the Rise of International Terrorism. We will focus mainly on nationalist terror outside of the U.S., mostly in the Middle East, with the rise of the Palestine Liberation Organization, or PLO, after a discussion of the historical background of the conflict there. Like many terrorist actions of the second half of the 20th century, terrorism of the new left, those which espouse socialist or communist views, were given great impulse by the Cold War. Not only were Western capitalist democracies like Britain, France, and the U.S. the losers of imperial war in places like Palestine, Algeria, and Vietnam, but their hostility to communism, and the Soviet Union in particular, played out on the world stage in these national conflicts. We focus on the Middle East. As we saw in the readings and recent lectures, Jewish migrants to the Middle East joined a small native Jewish community there. Throughout the early 20th century, but especially in the years leading up to World War II, the Jews of Palestine, who numbered over a half million, agitated for statehood. This movement is referred to as Zionism. Jewish neighbors in the Middle East, the Arabic-speaking population, feared a Zionist state and its attendant loss of privileges and rights, and opposed outright the plan to grant Israel statehood. In this, the Palestinian Arabs were supported by most Arab leaders of the neighboring countries, noticeably, notably rather, King Farouk of Egypt and King Abdullah I of Jordan on the east bank of the Jordan River. The United Nations, newly formed after World War II, found itself tested early on by the Israel question. Originally, Israeli territory was to be a shallow U-shape of land in what was formerly British Palestine, mainly in areas where Jews were in a clear majority. That's shown uh, on the map on the right in green. This territory, as proposed by the UN, the Jewish homeland, was neither satisfactory in terms of size nor defensibility from the Jewish perspective. Nonetheless, the Jews accepted the general framework of this agreement. Their Arab neighbors, however, did not. The founding of Israel unilaterally in 1947, with U.S. backing, made that country a U.S. ally, a decision which has greatly shaped U.S. policy and the region itself. In 1948, the Arab nations of Transjordan, now modern Jordan, Syria, Iraq, and Lebanon fought the forces of Israel for nine months. At the end of the conflict, Israel was a decisive winner, seizing a large amount of territory from the Palestinian Arabs and forcing hundreds of thousands of Palestinian Arabs from their homes. King Abdullah I, the great-grandfather of the present-day King of Jordan, lost out on his bid to dominate the Palestinian Arabs. Although he, like many Arab leaders, never recognized any nationalist aspirations to the Arabs of Palestine. As the former president of Syria, Hafez al-Assad, the father of the, pres the current president of Syria, Bashar al-Assad, once remarked to Yasser Arafat, remember, there is no Palestine, there is only Syria. By this, Assad meant that in Arab thinking from the medieval or early modern era, the entire eastern coast of the Mediterranean, from Turkey to Egypt, was called Syria. Thus, the countries of Syria, Lebanon, parts of Iraq, Jordan, and Israel all belong historically, geographically, to Syria. The point here is that conflicting notions of heritage, geography, ethnicity, and the claims of certain groups to the land are historically contingent and f are far more complicated than they appear. So in addition to Palestinian claims, for example, in the Levant on the eastern Mediterranean seaboard, you also have these hegemonic claims of countries like Syria and also Jordan, who historically had claims to some or all of the territory. However, we can't really understand any of this conflict without understanding the politics of the Cold War. In the 1950s and 60s, uh, great changes were afoot. In Africa and the Middle East, decolonization had begun. World War II had left the major colonial powers of the region exhausted. The U.S. supported most nationalist movements against their former British and French allies because the U.S. feared that not to do so would throw these movements 
and the states they hoped to found into the arms of the Soviet Union. Indeed, this is exactly what happened in places like Egypt, where the Egyptian revolution of Gamal Abdel Nasser. Egypt had been nominally independent since 1922, but in fact it was under the dominance of the threat of British military in intervention. This occurred when, in 1956, Western governments, especially the United States, refused to fund the proposed construction of the Aswan High Dam in the Nile Valley in southern Egypt. President Nasser, who had seized power in a military coup and remained officially neutral in the Cold War at that point, turned to the Soviet Union, who lent Egypt the money to build the dam. In 1956, Nasser attempted to nationalize the Suez Canal, which led to an armed intervention by Britain and France, the two principal shareholders of the canal. They were joined in the fight by Israel. Under intense pressure from popular protests at home, French and British forces withdrew after a negotiated settlement that reopened the canal, while the Israelis were the last forces to leave. The incident cost thousands of lives and left Egypt embittered, with only a Pyrrhic victory to show for their trouble. The Suez Crisis made it impossible for the U.S. to sell arms to Egypt and forced President Nasser closer to the arms of the Soviet Union. The Suez Crisis was also Britain's last war in the Middle East until their first Iraq War, and it marked the end of more than a century of British domination as an imperial power in the region. Surrounded by hostile neighbors, none of which would recognize Israel's right to exist, much less its statehood, Israel began to prepare for the inevitable next conflict. In the meantime, both King Hussein of Jordan, who has acceded to the Jordanian throne in 1952, and Egypt were determined to wipe Israel off the map. Lebanon had never ceased its hostilities, and Syria and Iraq remained dedicated to the destruction of the Jewish state. Saudi Arabia, although it shared no border with Israel, supported its elimination, as did most other Arab states throughout the region. If we turn east, we find uh, that another key component of the Middle East struggle, and one that is in the news today, is Iran. In 1953, the United States and Great Britain orchestrated a coup against Mohammad Mossadegh, the democratically elected Prime Minister of Iran. Mossadegh intended to nationalize British Petroleum's interest in Iran, arguing that Great Britain was making hundreds of millions of dollars from his nation's oil wealth, but paying only pennies on the dollar. This, of course, is true. With British interests so threatened, the British acted with American support. Because Mossadegh was not sufficiently anti-communist, the American government favored his removal and replacement with a more reliable client ruler. They found this in the form of the Shah, the hereditary ruler of Iran, whose power had been displaced by a new democratic constitution and reformers who make, aim to make Iran more open, modern, and independent. The CIA engineered Mossadegh's overthrow and replacement of a democracy with the absolutism of the Shah, Reza Pahlavi. The Shah of Iran became a loyal U.S. ally and staunch anti-communist. Iran was the strongest and most important ally of the U.S. in the Middle East. The U.S. could not, however, stabilize the region, which was increasingly important because of its oil wealth. U.S. Im oil imports continued to grow throughout the 1960s. Saudi Arabia and Iran, both U.S. allies, were rapidly becoming wealthy as petrodollars flowed in. Arab nationalism was at an all-time high. Led mainly by Egypt, Pan-Arabism, a movement that dreamed for the unification of all Arabic-speaking countries in a secular and religious state, was prominent among Arab leaders and nationalists. President Gamal Abdel Nasser, the president of Egypt, was the foremost among these Pan-Arabist leaders. Egypt even briefly merged with Syria to create the United Arab Republic from 1958 to 61, a move intended, ironically, to counter communist influence in Syria. This is obviously uh, rather funny, since Washington viewed Egypt as a natural ally of the Soviet Union and pro-communist. In fact, Nasser intervened in Syria because he was fear afraid that the communists would take power there. In reality, then, Egypt was an ally of the Soviet Union by necessity, not by choice, and because it was on the wrong side of the Israeli question. Only Egypt's hostility to Israel countered a U.S. interest, kept it out of the pro-Western, 
pro-capitalist camp of the Cold War. Throughout the 1960s, Nasser and King Hussein of Jordan supported guerrilla groups in the West Bank in Israeli-occupied Palestine. These so-called Fedayeen commandos were guerrilla troops who frequently attacked Israeli forces and settlements in acts directed against both military and soft civilian tar targets in acts of terrorism designed to pressure the Israeli government to keep tensions high and to keep the Israelis off balance in the occupied territories. In 1964, the Palestine Liberation Organization, the PLO, was founded in Cairo at the 1964 Arab League summit with the backing of most Arab leaders. The express aim of the PLO was to eject Zionists from the region and for the Palestinians to be able to return to their homeland, since hundreds of thousands of them were now refugees in neighboring Jordan, Lebanon, and Syria. The 1960s witnessed the decolonization of Algeria, where the French were forced to quit the country after a brutal and bloody civil war. Although rarely learned about in America, the French war in Algeria resembled our slightly later involvement in Vietnam. Just as the U.S. in Vietnam, the French at one point had over a half million soldiers in Algeria. Despite the Herculean effort, the FLN guerrillas and the French public opinions spelled defeat for the French and the end of their rule there. Bolstered by their success in the Suez Crisis, in the liberation of Algeria, and with other Arab countries basking in newfound oil wealth, Pan-Arabism and Arab nationalism were riding at an all-time high in the 1960s. It seemed like only a matter of time before the Israeli question would be resolved. By 1966, Egypt, with the largest population and army in the region, and its allies Syria, Iraq, and Lebanon were preparing for war. A Syrian, radio broad, a Syrian radio broadcast in 1966 stated, quote, We have decided to drench this land with our blood, to oust you aggressors and throw you into the sea for good, unquote. Egypt, with 240,000 soldiers, the largest air force in the region, with more than 400 modern combat jets supplied by the Soviet Union, as well as Soviet-supplied surface-to-air missile systems and the latest Soviet radars, posed a major threat to Israel, only slightly more the neighboring Syria and Jordan. In May 1967, Israel stated they would attack Syria if the latter did not stop sponsoring terrorist attacks across the border. The Israeli army also engaged Fedayeen guerrillas who crossed into Israeli territory from the West Bank, then controlled by Jordan, and pursued them, became engaged in a bloody battle with Jordanian soldiers in which 18 of the latter were killed. King Hussein signed an alliance with Nasser of Egypt, either to convince the other Arab states that he was not a Western stooge or out of fear for his throne, or that the Israelis would invade and seize the West Bank, which he believed belonged to Jordan. Nasser moved 100,000 Egyptian troops into the Sinai and kicked out the United Nations Blue Helmets, the peacekeepers who had been deployed there since the Suez Crisis to maintain the peace. Syria moved 75,000 troops to the border north of Israel, while Jordan deployed 55,000 soldiers and modern U.S. supplies, tanks, and artillery along the eastern border with Israel. Once Egypt had occupied the Sinai Peninsula, Nasser declared the states of Straits of Tehran, the international waterway between Sinai and Saudi Arabia, closed to Israeli shipping, and Israel publicly stated that they would consider such an attempt to close the Straits an act of war. U.S. President Lyndon Johnson, deeply embroiled in Vietnam, was unwilling to act in the Middle East. On May 27th, Nasser stated, quote, Our basic objective will be the, the destruction of Israel. The Arab people want to fight, unquote. The die was cast, and Nasser staked his legacy on a belief that he could hold off an Israeli advance and then counterattack and destroy the Israeli army. On the morning of June 5th, Israel launched a surprise aerial attack, sending all its operational jet aircraft into the skies. They flew low over the sea to avoid Egyptian radars, sweeping both over the Mediterranean and Red Sea before attacking their targets, the Egyptian Air Force, which was neither prepared for the assault nor bunkered. Israeli pilots had drilled intensely for months on their runs, practicing on dummy airfields and memorizing every detail of their attack plan and targets. The results were devastating. Egypt's Air Force was crippled in the first hour, 
236 of 420 Egyptian aircraft were destroyed on the ground, while the Israelis lost 13 planes. Israel would have air superiority for the rest of the war. Israeli forces advanced into Sinai, attacking Egyptian forces through the desert when the latter believed that the main Israeli assaults would come down the major roads into the peninsula. The Israelis had broken through key sectors of the Egyptian front already by the first day of the battle. However, Egyptian propaganda broadcasts claimed victory for Egypt. Nasser urged King Hussein of Jordan to attack in the West Bank because he said he was victorious over the Israelis in Sinai. Jordanian forces moved around Jerusalem and began to shell Israeli positions. This drew the Israeli army stationed there into the West Bank. On the morning of June 5th, also buoyed by Nasser's claims that he had defeated Israel's attack, the Syrians entered the war, shelling Israel from their strategic position of the Golan Heights and launching aerial attack. The Israeli Air Force destroyed two-thirds of the Syrian Air Force on the ground that evening. The Israeli Air Force then pummeled a feeble Syrian effort to advance while their forces held their ground. By June 7th, Syria unilaterally declared a ceasefire with no stomach to fight in the face of Israeli air supremacy. But Israel ignored the offer and invaded the Golan in retaliation for the terrorist and guerrilla actions supported by Syria before the war. When fighting ended on June 10th and a ceasefire was signed by all parties on June 11th, Israel's victory was total. Although outnumbered in and fighting on multiple fronts, sometimes against opponents with superior weaponry, the Israeli Defense Force had humiliated their foes. Arab states were shocked to the core. Jerusalem, prior to the war, had been a divided city, like Berlin, and it was quickly now made a Jewish capital, following the Jewish occupation. The West Bank, the Golan Heights, and the Gaza Strip were all annexed. The political repercussions of the Six-Day War are immense. About 300,000 of the one million Palestinians from the West Bank fled to Jordan. By 1970, Palestinians made up about a third of the Jordanian population. About 80,000 Syrians fled from the Golan Heights. Palestinians also poured into Lebanon. The PLO, which had fought in the struggle, was forced out of Jerusalem and into Jordan, where their, their relations between uh, the PLO and King Hussein were uneasy. The Six-Day War, as the 1967 conflict was called, left indelible marks in the region. Egypt eventually relinquished its territorial claim to Gaza, and Jordan eventually did the same with the West Bank. The Golan Heights were annexed by Israel, while Syria views these as part of its territory and remains at war. Jordan, convinced that it would not be able to defeat Israel militarily, and that it was not in the interest to, to continue its interest to continue its hostilities, instead allow the PLO to usurp its place among the Palestinians in the West Bank. The PLO, uh, led from 1969 by Yasser Arafat, who had founded Fatah, one of the PLO's member organizations, was named leader of the Palestinians. He took control of the PLO and led resistance against the Israelis, first with Jordanian backing as in the Battle of Karameh, in which Fatah fighters offered stubborn resistance to advancing Israeli troops who attacked this town in Jordan in response to PLO rocket and mortar attacks. As the fighting escalated, the Jordanian army intervened and the Israelis eventually withdrew to avoid another large-scale war with its neighbor. King Hussein watched the influence of Arafat and the PLO grow within Jordan, which was poor and a poor and weak country that had to cope with hundreds of thousands of Palestinian refugees, most of whom refused his offer of Jordanian citizenship. In the late 60s, the PLO acted virtually independent of the Jordanian government, a state within a state that relied on international Arab leaders for money, arms, and support, a situation that King Hussein found increasingly intolerable. In 1968, another militant wing of the PLO the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, a leftist organization with Marxist-Leninist ideology led by the Palestinian Christian doctor George Habash, hijacked an Israeli al flight from Rome and diverted it to Algiers, Algeria. After more than a month of negotiations, both the hostages and hijackers were freed. Such political efforts were broadcast around the world on the growing global media of television for which such spectacular acts were tailor-made. 
Habash, a communist, and its PFLP was a Marxist group with backing from the Soviet Union and their proxy states, and these aimed at a revolution within Jordan. On September 6, 1970, George Habash's PFLP planned and orchestrated one of the more daring terrorist attacks in history. The simultaneous hijackings of four airliners headed to London and New York. TWA Flight 741, en route to New York City from Frankfurt, Germany, Swiss Air Flight 100, en route from Zurich to New York, and Pan Am Flight 93, flying from Amsterdam to New York, were hijacked and flown first to Beirut and then Cairo. Uh, the first two airliners were flown to the uh, Jordanian desert. PFLP members attempted to hijack Israeli LL Flight 219 from Amsterdam, uh, but Israeli guards thwarted the effort and captured the Palestinian hijackers, killing one, Patrick Arguello, and, and the other, a female hijacker, Leila Khaled, whose photogenic looks and brash, unapologetic manner would make her an international icon of terrorists and resistors around the world. Three of the jets were forced to fly to Jordan I'm sorry, two of the jets were forced to fly to Jordan, where they landed in the desert at an old RAF airfield called Dawson's Field. The third jet, which, which was uh, the TWA flight, or the Pan Am flight, rather, 93, was too large to land in the desert, or so the captain convinced the uh, hijackers, and it was uh, diverted first to Beirut, then Cairo. It was wired with dynamite and blown apart on the runway, although all the crew and the uh, uh, hostages escaped harm. Two days later, on September 9th, PFLP sympathizers hijacked the British airliner flying from Bahrain and diverted it to Dawson's Field. King Hussein of Jordan watched helplessly as the world media broadcast pictures of the Western airliners and passing camels in a surreal scene. He and his country were humiliated. The crisis deepened. On September 10th, King Hussein's forces engaged PFLP fighters in the Jordanian capital of Amman where the PFLP were holding hostages at the Intercontinental Hotel. Hussein watched helplessly as the Palestinians at Dawson's Field blew up the hijacked planes emptied of their hostages on international television. Meanwhile, the PLO declared the northern Jordanian city of Irbid liberated and thus declared a full-scale civil war and its intent to overthrow Hussein and turn Jordan into a Palestinian Marxist state. Jordan was warned by Syria and Iraq that they would intervene on, uh, to protect the Palestinians. For his part, King Hussein had the backing of the U.S. and even Israel, who was asked by the U.S. to intervene if the Syrians and Iraqis should in fact attack. On September 16th, King Hussein declared martial law and began a military offensive against the Palestinians. In the ensuing violence, the hijacked passengers were moved around Amman and were in great danger. Hussein's troops defeated, defeated the PLO's Fedayeen guerrilla fighters. Fighting was intense. Several thousand Palestinian civilians were killed and an unknown number of PLO fighters, probably around a thousand. The Syrian military, which sent tanks into Jordan to support the PLO, suffered more than 600 dead under bombardment by the Jordanian Air Force. Two weeks later, the hostages of the four airliners were returned to their respective governments in exchange for the hijacker Leila Khaled and the former uh, other PFLP terrorists. Jordan, who had confronted its internal threats and proved victorious, was now more than ever drawn into the U.S.-Israel orbit against its Iraqi and Syrian neighbors, who remained Soviet clients. Members of Fatah, Arafat's militant wing of the PLO, founded a terrorist organization in 1971 named Black September to commemorate the defeat at the hands of Jordanian forces. Black September conducted the kidnappings and killings of the Israeli Olympic team in the 1972 Munich Olympics that you will learn about in the documentary, One Day in September. International terrorism was the, the result of Palestinian efforts, and they and their Middle Eastern compatriots, such as Abu Nidal, would dominate the international terrorist arena in order to publicize their cause throughout the 1980s. Yasser Arafat led the PLO into southern Lebanon following his defeat at the hands of Jordanian forces. There, the influx of fighters dramatically changed the balance of power and destabilized the country. 
Arafat established the PLO, again as a state within a state. Beirut, Lebanon became the headquarters of the PLO and Lebanon its main base of attacks on Israel and its neighbors. The PLO presence in Beirut contributed directly to the start of the Lebanese Civil War. The PLO came to control Sidon and Tyre, cities in the south of Lebanon, and gained control of West Beirut by early, the early 1970s. Arafat and the PLO sparked the Lebanese Civil War, in which multiple groups battled along sectarian and nationalist lines. Eventually, Syria occupied most of Lebanon, and the PLO was forced to evacuate Beirut and leave Lebanon following an Israeli invasion in 1983. The Lebanese Civil War raged from 1975 to 90 and led to, among other things, the rise of the terrorist group Hezbollah as Iran became involved in the Shia community of Lebanon.